hand over to Sheila to make a very special introduction. Thanks, Mary. Well, um, choosing a keynote um, is one of, as I found out over the past year, is one of the, the best parts of being a conference co-chair. I've never chaired a conference before, but that, that's been really exciting. And along with my fellow trustees, when we were discussing the, the conference keynotes, we had quite a hit list, if you like, of people that we wanted to invite. And I was absolutely delighted when this name was pretty high up on the, the list. But also, I was even more pleased when Amber said yes to the invitation to come and speak here today. Amber currently heads the academic technology team at the University of Warwick, and she leads her team in the rollout and implementation of many learning technologies. She's also, over the past year, taking a leader, leadership role in the Heads of eLearning Forum. So for those of you in the UK that are involved in the strategic direction and implementation of learning technologies, you realise how important that group is to all of us. Um, but before moving to Warwick, Amber's had quite a long and varied career that I think has touched on practically all sectors of the education system here in the UK through her work in BECTA, through her work with colleges, and more recently with her, her work at JISC when she was a program manager. And I think it's fair to say that Amber was quite a pivotal figure in the UK OER program. I've been really fortunate in my working life that our paths have crossed on several occasions and I think Amber is just one of those people I always really, really like getting the opportunity to speak to and to listen to what Amber has to say. Um, I like getting her advice um, and occasionally, like last year, I also get to hear her sing, which is quite a treat as well. Um, but more importantly, I think Amber's knowledge, her vision, her criticality, and her pragmatism make her an outstanding professional in learning technology. Um, she also has a great sense of humor, and she's just a great person to be around. I heart Amber. Uh, but I remember in the learning days of, of learn in the early days of learning analytics, I think Amber came up with the, the phrases about Pimpact and Vanalytics when we were all slightly obsessed by our social media scores. How many of us remember Clout? and many of us still check our clout, uh, clout score. Um, but I know this morning, Amber's reflection on 20 years of uh, her experience of 20 years in learning technology, I'm sure will resonate with me, with me and many of you in, in the audience. And for those of you who are a bit younger, um, listen to Amber, I'm sure what she's going to say will resonate with you too. So I would like you all to please join with me in welcoming our keynote for today, Amber Thomas. Thank you, Sheila. I am honoured and terrified, genuinely terrified, to speak to you today, um, my peer community. And I'd like to start by saying a big hello to everyone in the room and everyone watching online. As you'll see, I've got a lot to say, and I've squished many thoughts into this talk. I'm going to start by telling you a bit about my journey to, to this point, and then I've got some thoughts about innovation and change and how to be a good institutional learning technologist. And I'll end with some thoughts about our community more broadly. So first, a bit about me. I thought that I would map my history against Weller's 25-year timeline. And I confess, I actually went a bit further than that. I marked myself out of, uh, zero to three on all of these. But that's for another blog post. I put it in a spreadsheet and did a star system and everything. Uh, but here we go. So um, I'm 42 years old, it's the magic number. And uh, 1993, I was nowhere near educational technology. I was uh, finishing my A-levels and discovering beer and boys. OK. Uh, and then I, my degree was in philosophy and literature. So like many of you, I didn't come uh, to this through computer sciences route. Uh, and in fact, I then, when I graduated, I realized I did not have a clue what I was going to do next. I was lucky enough that my first role, I had a really good uh, staff development boss, and she really developed me and encouraged me to go and uh, take all the courses and get involved with all the things. 
and I actually started off in university administration and went to uh, an administrators conference where I first heard about lots of things, including the idea of process improvement and systems and corporate information systems. And for some reason, I thought that was really, really interesting. And then I had an opportunity to go and work for JISC, for the person that I had seen speaking at that conference, in fact, on information strategies. And that was a real privilege because I got to go around probably 25, 30 uh, institutions, mainly HE at that point, um, and learn about how those different organizations operated. Um, from there, I then went to Bechter, where I worked on the National Grid for Learning content portal, which was all about schools content development, and then to FURL, which I recognize many faces from those days of working with um, FE. Um, brief stint at the University of Worcester on a GISC funded project about sharing teaching and learning materials. And then considerable amount of time uh, at JISC, uh, when I, where I worked with many people on a, a whole range of projects. A um, very privileged position to work on a whole range of projects there and services. And then 2012, I came to the University of Warwick, uh, where I'm now head of academic technology and digital transformation. I did do a bit of life. In the meantime, thinking of personal political history, I did get married and I had, somehow I had two babies during that time while I was working at JISC, uh, in between all the conferences. Um, I think that my first alt C was uh, 2001, which uh, very mem memorable, that was uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, it was, I was at alt C in Edinburgh when it was 9-11, um, so alt C sort of a bonding experience, I think, for those of us that were there. And since then, I've been to a number of alt -Cs, and I'm not entirely sure which years I went to, hence the question marks. But my big contribution, probably, to alt so far was 2011, uh, where we, we had uh, the first time there, we did a fancy dress session. So you can see there, Helen Beetham, David Kernhan, David White, and myself, and sorry to my colleagues for, for showing that picture. Uh, fancy dress at Alt-C, that's the first time for everything. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you from that bracket, one of the brackets that Tressy talked about in her keynote yesterday. I think I'm a learning technologist, I think I am, and thank you to, to Laurie for that book cover. We discussed, don't we, what it means to be a learning technologist. There's been a recent discussion on the old members list about what it actually means to be a learning technologist. Um, we ask ourselves a lot of questions about what that means, and especially as institutional learning technologists. So hold that thought. Because I often don't feel like I am a proper learning technologist. I'm in an academic institution, but I'm not an academic. I'm a learning technologist who's not a teacher, researcher, or staff developer. Unlike many of my, my peers, I don't have a master's degree in ed tech. I'm a manager of people who do things that I can't do. I'm a woman in IT, and I'm an IT manager, an IT person who's not a programmer. So it all stacks up to quite a lot of imposter syndrome. And according to Kiriaki's research, I'm not alone, it's very common for heads of e-learning and senior learning technologists to have a touch of imposter syndrome. So looked at like this, I would place myself somewhere outside that. <laughs> I don't do and I'm not expert in any of those things. But then perhaps over the 20 years I've been working in educational technology, I have gained expertise and experience in a whole, whole number of uh, overlapping fields. And when I look at it that way, I'm kind of at the center of my own little Venn diagram there. And actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, many of the things that I do require me to travel between and across these areas, to listen and translate between them, to recognize what kind of problem we're talking about at any one kind, and therefore what our options are for how to solve it. So maybe, maybe that imposter syndrome, that feeling of being on the edge, is a characteristic of needing to travel between those domains. And I wonder how many of you feel the same. And maybe this is okay. 
So I'm going to start with some thoughts about innovation. That's a bingo word, isn't it? Innovation, bingo. So for my entire career, I've heard predictions that we're on the edge of a revolution or on the brink of a landslide. And there's certainly been plenty of moral panics in the meantime. And as Martin Weller points out in The Digital Scholar, in our discourse, there's much talk about utopian or dystopian uh, visions of the future in educational technology. Now, at the moment, everyone's talking about disruptive innovation. And what I wanted to highlight is that people often assume that innovation will come from the outside, that new technologies will be brought into education, there'll be new suppliers to the market, that change will come from private sector, new business models coming in. I wanted to bring your attention to this concept of the entrepreneurial state. And Mazzucati wrote about how often the state creates the conditions for innovation, how often the state funds the R&D and creates the market. I'm going to talk about FutureLearn. So FutureLearn was launched late 2012, and the media covered it as a new entrant to the HE market, a disruptive innovation. Those of us who've been in the field quite a long time will remember another attempt to package UK HE courses for online consumption, the e-university. I think some people have got the scars to prove it. But back to 2012, here we go. Here's another go. Enter FutureLearn. Mainly six to 12 week courses entirely online, modelled obviously on, on existing MOOC uh, platforms such as Coursera and edX. Its products were free at the point of use. But here's the thing, they weren't free to create, they weren't free to produce. They were created by staff in existing institutions. Pat Lockley at Pigogi Consulting, here of the Penguins, sampled universities with a freedom of information request on what they'd spent on producing courses for FutureLearn. Now, uh, 19 institutions reported their spend, and that doesn't include the Open University, but of those 19 institutions, they reported three and a half million pounds spent on the courses that they produced for FutureLearn. My question is not whether they got return on investment. My point is that they spent a lot of money on FutureLearn. So how much have UK universities spent on making this happen? And that's even without talking about the Open University's role in this. In many ways, there's been a huge subsidy for FutureLearn. And probably that's the right thing to do. But what interests me is that somehow the media narrative was one of disruptive innovation. You'd read the articles in the newspapers and it made it sound as if this was entirely coming from the outside of our sector. That it was a new entrant to the market. It was these new people teaching stale old UK HE a thing or two about digital social learning. But we did it. So that's kind of ouchy to hear. So I think we've got a lot to learn, there's no doubt about that, and there's many areas where we need to change. But I question the popular narrative that all the change is going to come from outside. I've been lucky enough, as, as uh, Sheila introduced me and as I mentioned on my timeline, to have been involved with uh, a whole range of uh, agencies over my 20 years in EdTech. Um, and just to give a, a bit of background, at Bechter, there was the National Grid for Learning, which brought broad, broadband to schools uh, and then had a number of regional and national initiatives to help schools benefit from that. Alongside that, there were initiatives like Curriculum Online, National Curriculum ICT Expertise, Assistive Technology, Computer Games in Education, all kinds of state-funded initiatives. And in EFI, we had FURL. Uh, and the Information Learning Technology ILT Champions and the FURL Practitioners Programme and the National Le Learning Network materials. And I uh, worked alongside them and Bechter's community and adult learning team. And in universities, I helped to develop the Open Access Research Repository Network and worked on the UK Open Educational Resources Programme, particularly with the Joram Repository of Sharing Learning Materials. And it wasn't just about the agencies that you see on those slides, because we also worked with the HEA subject centres and organisations like NILTA and NIACE. I'm curious how many people in this room and watching online have been involved with these sorts of agencies. So we've got a quick poll for you. We've got a quick poll. 
hadn't warned you at the back. <laughs> so I'm um, going to ask you about your experience uh, via Me Too. Is that coming up? So some of you will see it already, you see the questions on the Me Too. Interested to know, in the room and, and online, how many have been involved with FURL, ILT Champions or National Learning Network, because I recognise lots of faces. How many of you have been involved with projects funded by JISC or other government or EU projects? Just give you another half a minute. We've got results coming in? Great. Brilliant. Now, the first one's really interesting because that's a higher proportion of people who've been involved with those initiatives than are currently FE members of ALT. So it goes to show that we're overlapping and connected communities. That second one's incredible. 80% of people who've responded have been involved in some way by projects funded by JISC. And pretty impressive as well. Look at that other government funded or EU government funded projects. Nearly 60%. Thank you. So these were state funded sector wide change programs. In the history of EdTech, Governments are often referred to as slow to change, as blockers to innovation, as regulators that are too late. But if you look at what we've achieved in the UK, it tells a slightly different story. There's a long tradition of influencing the marketplace, stimulating demand for new types of digital products, setting and nurturing standards and improving supply. There's a lot of collective endeavour. So not strictly EdTech, but look at interlibrary loans, open access repositories, look at the Janet network itself, and open standards, IMS content packaging, experience API, and open source. Look at Xerti, close to home, look at H5P, Scandinavia, and look at Moodle around the world. There's so many examples of collective endeavor. So there's a lot of talk at the moment about disruptive innovation, and we can be quite critical of our ability to change. But the point I want to make is it's not all commercial vendors and market forces imposed on us. We've actually done some really great things together. HE. HE is not unique. And maybe we should stop talking about how unique we are and we should listen. We should listen to schools, to FE, but we should also listen to healthcare and government. Because so many sectors are having a digital turn. Digital transformation is a thing. We don't own it. It's not just our challenge. Thinking of healthcare, I sometimes imagine a new tool being introduced into a hospital, and I wonder whether consultants and surgeons could say, hmm, it doesn't really fit my practice. I prefer traditional methods. There might be some lessons about practice change that we could learn from healthcare. Okay, this is the best I could find, but I challenged someone to do one of these for institutional learning technologists. I think the things that we discuss as a community of practice are not always the things that we're doing. Or at least they're not always the things that we're spending most of our time on. I was looking at the data from the old members survey, um, and I know it's, it's quite hard to read on the slide, but a wide range of uh, things that people are spending their time doing there. And in the top five, that looks pretty much like my top five as well, actually, content management systems, VLEs, electronic assessment, blended learning, and so on. And in the bottom five are a lot of the things that we talk about at conferences. So that's interesting. And let's have a particular look at learning analytics, which comes there somewhere near the middle of concerns. So alt members have reported for themselves that, that this is an area growing in importance. And the Heads of eLearning Forum has also done a, a survey on how important and what stage of maturity learning analytics are at. So this is one person uh, replying on behalf of their institution with a sort of bird's eye view. And you'll see there 
62%, the vast majority, that's a really bad pie, pie diagram, isn't it? Working towards implementation, and some partially implemented, and fair number not implemented at all. So we're talking about it a lot, and that's right, and we need to understand what that is, but we mustn't confuse that with representing what we're spending our time doing. I couldn't resist sharing that one. And a serious point there is that we won't get traction just because something is interesting to us. It has to be the right time and it has to be the point at which this is useful to us and to our institutions. Because learning analytics is still emerging and that's okay. And meanwhile, we're pretty busy with our VLEs and our uh, e-assessment. I sometimes hear people saying at alt -C, why are we still talking about this? Why are we still talking about this? Like, why are we still talking about how to use a VLE and roll out a VLE? Why are we still talking about active learning in the classroom? Because this isn't it, isn't it? <laughs> this isn't it. So who is we? Because at this conference, there'll be some people here for the first time, some people new to this field. And we come from different fields, we converge together, and participation is always in flux. Second point, I also commend to you Martin Weller's concluding post in his 25-year series. He points out that, uh, for example, intelligent tutoring systems, sometimes you need a few cycles at an idea to get it accepted. So we do need to go round things a few times. But thirdly, and most importantly, what kind of practice-based knowledge can just be solved? That's it, we've worked it out. There we go. Example, so project managers. Lots of us work with project managers. There's professional frameworks for project management. There are courses, qualifications, conferences, communities. It's a practice. People are inducted into the practice. They use the concepts. They continue to learn, develop those concepts. They never stop learning about how to do good project management. And where, where I'm based on campus, I work near our Centre for Teacher Training. And obviously, they're just given a single textbook on classroom behaviour management, and they pass a test and they're done. Yeah? They never need to discuss classroom uh, behaviour management again. No? No. It's a topic that they continue to develop their practice in. So we're, we're a learning community. And next time you catch yourself saying, why are we still talking about this? I'd suggest that it might not be a learning opportunity for you, but someone's probably learning, and actually we still should be. Change takes time. Does all of this mean that we're being slow to respond? It's worth thinking about how long it takes to identify opportunities for a change to a module, for example. That module, in a HE sense, might only run once a year. You might be thinking about it that first year. You try and pilot things the second year. You make the changes the third year. That's three years. That's quite a significant cycle. Does that sound too long? Well, of course it takes a while for innovations to be adopted. I'm going to quote Weller again. He says, change in universities is no game for the impatient. There was a really good series of podcasts uh, by Tim Harford about 50 things that made the modern economy. And one of them is about electrification. And he says that they built the infrastructure for Maine's electricity in Manhattan in about 1881. It was all ready and waiting for the factories. But it took over 30 years to exploit it. I quote, factory owners hesitated for understandable reasons. You couldn't just rip out the steam engine and replace it with an electric motor. You needed to change everything the architecture and the production process. And because workers had more autonomy and flexibility, you even had to change the way they were recruited, trained, and paid. Of course, they didn't want to scrap their existing capital. But maybe, too, they simply struggled to think through the implication of a world where everything needed to adapt to the new technology. In the end, change happened. It was unavoidable. Does that sound familiar? Is this where we are with blended learning? Are we still talking about blended learning after 30 years? Yes. Yes, we are. 
2018 is a challenging year in many ways. I'm wearing my anti-Brexit badge there. <laughs> We've got Trump looming. In many ways, it feels like dangerous times. But it also seems to be a period of intense reflection for our community, the year of critical ed tech. It can be hard to be an institutional learning technologist in 2018, and sometimes I wonder, are we the baddies? So how can we be a force for good? It's not about the technology. Many of the conversations I have start with someone saying, the tool will do this. And I say, no, no, you will do this using the tool. Or someone says, and this tool will make sure that everybody shares all the information. And I say, do they already share the information? They say, no, 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 they don't. But when they've got this tool, they'll share the information. And I think, hmm. At the end of the day, digital is people. It's made of our labor. Digital education, particularly, is made of academic labor. So it's really not just about the technology. But there's no digital education without technology. I'm going to quote Anne-Marie Scott here, put the quote on the slide on a post that she did around next generation digital learning environments. And she's pointing out all the things that we do have to worry about, actually, to make sure that that technology is working. And as she says, high maintenance costs and risky student experience just isn't something that institutions find easy to stomach. But talking, for this, talking about this makes for a rubbish conference presentation, though, so we rarely do. <laughs> Sorry. But technology knowledge definitely matters. Money matters as well. Money definitely matters. I ran a panel session at Last Altsy called uh, Evidence Bases and Business Cases. And I said then, it's fashionable to roll your eyes about management concerns. It makes it sound like it's somebody else's problem. But when you get to a certain level as a learning technologist, you have to develop some understanding of costs. And by that, I don't mean that we should do things because they might be profitable or because they might save money. I mean that we work in education systems and, and organizations that have limited budgets, and we need to understand what the role of the finance is in those projects. We need to understand what the constraints are. And all of this feels quite alien when you start having to write the options appraisal and the business case. But I think we shouldn't be silenced by it. I think we probably need to learn it and we need to speak it. Right. <laughs> Disciplines matter. I've seen a lot of learning technology conference presentations, and I've got a particular bugbear. There are particular kinds of projects uh, that get a lot of airtime in our literature. And it's often small cohorts, master's level, and disproportionately education. And then in the evidence base, we see a lot of noise from those sorts of scenarios, and a lot less from others. Now, this is quite unscientific, I have to say. Uh, not scientifically proven. I'd love to someone to do a literature review and have a look at that. And I'm particularly intrigued as well. There's some really good work that comes out of chemistry. Why is that? Chemistry as a discipline is really interesting. And it comes up with quite different models and conclusions to those that come from uh, that, the bit on the other side. So discipline definitely matters. It's also important to recognize that different disciplines are facing different challenges. So when you need to teach 30 people, it's easy to criticize people who are trying to work out how to teach 500 people in a lecture theater. And if you're in a discipline where it's about reading one text a week and discussing it at a seminar, sure, optimize around that, but recognize that other people in other subjects have got different challenges. Because if, on the other hand, you need lab skills and you've got the challenge of fitting people into the timetable, you've got different challenges. I think we should be very careful as a community to state our constraints and our disciplinary assumptions. A particular point on that is that a lot of the critical digital pedagogy voices that I've heard over the last couple of years have come from the liberal arts. But they're extrapolating quite widely from the liberal arts. 
And the challenges in those disciplines are not the same as maths or sociology or, or manufacturing. Discipline does matter. Evidence matters. We can't all be researchers and evaluators, though. And that's where, as someone in an institutional learning technology team, I'm very grateful for the alt community because my stakeholders can ask me a question about evidence and I can ask all of you. And communities of practice can be very efficient like this. But it also avoids this scenario. I've summarised on the slide there. Sometimes we should save ourselves the effort of giving people evidence when that's not really what they meant. I'll come back to that. One last point about evidence is that the evidence of benefits, the benefits might not be pedagogical, and that's okay. It might be time-saving, affordability, might be data quality, and that's all okay. I think that we can't afford to only care about the pedagogical evidence. I think we will sideline ourselves as a profession if we don't engage in the challenges of scale and sustainability. It's not about perfect. Diana Lorela described learning design as an analogous to building bridges. But I'd go further and say a lot of learning technology is about building bridges from here to there, using available materials, different terrain, constrained by time, cost and quality. And some of our bridges will not win prizes. But that's not the point. They're about getting people from here to there. So it's not about perfect. We only bring our best examples to conferences. But it's not the only thing that we care about. The important thing is that we're building those bridges and that we're being useful. Another point, don't design services for early adopters. I think we do this quite a lot. We design services based on pilots, and that's the early users. But the early market have different drivers for change and different tolerances for risk. So in early VLEs, people are interested in social and collaborative learning. And then mainstream uptake, people are interested in using it for document management. Early lecture capture, everyone's talking about flipped classroom. Mainstream uh, uptake of lecture capture, we're concentrating on frictionless recording, administrative benefits as well. Same technology, different benefits. And often, the mainstream prefer less choice and simpler defaults. And our systems may need to become simpler over time. Perhaps that's partly what's happening with next generation digital learning environments. As my colleague Kerry Pinney puts it, there is a silent majority versus the deafening minority. And it can be hard to hear the mainstream voices emerging. Be the one to ask the stupid question. This is definitely something that I've learned. I remember asking at a, I think it was a CETIS special interest group. They were showing the learning activity management system, LAMS. And it's like a design tool for sequencing learning activities in a VLE. And I said, do you mean it's like a lesson planner? And a lot of people look very embarrassed and slightly patronizing. <laughs> and the answer from the presenter was, yeah, it's like a lesson planner. <laughs> so I think say, say the things, be the one to ask the stupid question. And especially at this conference in this community, you're here, you've earned the right to put your hand up and say, what, what is it for? Why did you do it like that? What does that word mean? Ask the question because someone else was probably thinking it too. Dead birds. Not that kind of dead birds. That kind of dead birds. So this is a metaphor that I came up with a few years ago, and Laurie Phipps has uh, em embellished it. And here's what we're talking about. So cats sometimes bring humans dead birds. They're being their best cat selves and doing what they can do and showing us with their gifts. We don't want their gifts. Think back to when you handed in that project report you'd worked on so hard and senior management smiled and thanked you. But did they really want it? To quote Laurie, you need to be grounded in what is happening and what is needed and especially what your peers and senior managers want. Without that, it's another dead bird. Don't create a problem out of a solution or solve something that isn't a problem. Recognize the dead birds power. 
So this is from a future happens hack a few years ago. And one of the things that we discussed there was that some of us are at the table, actually. We're not all powerless. Also, sometimes your voice has more currency outside the institution than inside. And something we can all do is amplify the good work of colleagues across the sector. So when you're invited to the meeting about the thing, lean in. They might expect you to put forward a simple advocacy about the new thing, the new tool. Don't. Don't be simple. Give them something more nuanced. You're invited to the meeting. Say the things. If you think that they're heading up the wrong path, Name the unicorns, say the things, and recognize your power. We design tools to support workflows, and we're part of those workflows. And in many ways, digital education is made of labor, academic labor, and our labor. Some academics don't like to think that the organization has a say in their workflows. But they do, and we do. And some academics also like to assume that their needs are always aligned with the needs of students. But sometimes they aren't. And lecture capture has been a real battleground for this. Now, some of you will have been at Melissa Hyten's talk yesterday around lecture capture, that time of uh, industrial action. And to quote Melissa, if we work with technology for teaching and learning, then all our technology comes into contention during a strike. And I've certainly learned that the hard way. And Melissa's made the point before that perhaps we're at a bit of a pivot point here, where our power within, institution, within institutions is being recognized, and we need to recognize it. And we need to learn how to navigate these issues. So as institutional learning technologists, I think we need to be ethical, respectful, but most of all, I think we need to be useful. We really need to make sure that we're being useful. And thinking of us as a community, come back to my Venn diagram. Our field is big and wide and deep, and no one person can be experts in all these things. But maybe this is the job, and perhaps these edges are where we're learning. And perhaps, most importantly, these edges are where we are useful. And that's OK. And as I've put this talk together, I've reflected that perhaps the idea that learning technologies is a single field is an illusion. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps it never was a single field, never will be. Perhaps we're not a single field, but an intersect of many, many specialisms bound by a common purpose. But whatever we are, I do think that we are really important to the future of education. And I'll leave you with this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think your uh, applause said it all, but what a fantastic keynote. Thank you so Thank much, you. Amber. I'm sure there are some questions. I think we've got some questions coming up from the, the app. But um, also, is there anyone in the room? Is there anyone that would like to ask a question? Yeah, we've got a question there. We'll take that first, and then we'll maybe go to someone. Do you want to have a quick chat? Thank you so much, Amber. I would just ask um, if you were to design a um, undergrad degree for learning technology practitioners, which we don't, I guess we don't really have them. What would you include? How much philosophy? How much uh, computers? How much chemistry? How much theology? What would you wow. include? <laughs> well, thanks, Joey. That is a, a very terrifying question. <laughs> well, what, that would be an amazing shared project, would be to just design the curriculum even if we didn't actually build the course, to collectively design the curriculum would be fascinating. And I suspect that the actual computing bit would probably be about 20, 30%, and a lot of it would be about how decisions are made, how people teach, and that kind of issue. But that's, that's a brilliant idea. 
there's a project for us all. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions from the, the room just now? Okay, I think we've got a few online. Yeah. So I'm going to let Amber choose the question she wants to answer because I think that's only, only fair as well. <laughs> So a couple of, of points have uh, been asked about the uh, imposter syndrome, saying it's very common, what can we do to change this? Um, I, I have, I've read a bit about imposter syndrome, and I've heard that one of the things to do to change this is that anyone who's got it should admit it, so hence why I'm admitting it. Um, but also to, to recognise that other people can often see your value in ways that you might not be able to. So I think it's one of those things about if you're invited to say the things, if you're invited to go to the meeting, you're invited to contribute to the project, that's because people know that you will be useful. Mm. Absolutely. Can I just ask at this point, can anyone who has imposter syndrome just stand up? Okay, stand up. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> yes. Stay standing. Just now. now, you might have noticed that on, on my lanyard, um, underneath my name, it says the boss. I am the boss and I tell each and every one of you, none of you are imposters. So please, you have to remember that because I've said it now, so it's true. Okay? <laughs> none of us are imposters in this room. Here, here. <laughs> okay, anyway. okay. Does anyone else want any questions coming from the, the audience? Now that you're not imposters, you can ask, you can ask <laughs> questions. Oh, here, Marion? Thanks, Amber. What an inspiring talk. I've been looking forward to this to a long time. Um, you have so much experience and you've shared a lot about the different perspectives that you've had in your role. What, what do you think? Um, we've heard a lot about this is more a critical age of ed tech. If you were looking ahead at all, mm -hmm. is there anything you think you'd really like to see happen or you'd like to put out as a call to action to the audience? Sort of something to take Gosh. action on? That's a really good question. I wonder if it's something to do with demystifying things. So there's a lot of experience in the room, in the community, about these things that we've circled around again and again, like um, social learning uh, as it manifests itself through our tools, like group work and peer collaboration, now you can support that online. And I wonder if a very useful thing that we could do would be to have a plain English entry-level introduction into what it means to do these things well in a way that doesn't alienate people by referring to articles that they must go and read, that is actually at more of the practical level. And there's clearly been some really good work um, on the, the MOOCs and the shared courses. Uh, but even then, I wonder if there's something even more simpler, more distilled underneath that which means that we don't have to be at the meeting about the thing because someone else can have digested that and take ownership of it. Um, and uh, it, going back to Tressie's keynote yesterday, I think that example of at first we work in partnership, but then if these approaches become embedded and owned in each of those disciplines and each of those departments, we don't even need to be at the meeting because we will have framed the issues right and allowed people to learn those things themselves. I'm just going to take one of the questions here and just embellish it with <laughs> As you um, were presenting, Amber, and you made some very good points about state funding, and I think many of us in the room have been recipients of that, and it was certainly my career has developed, you know, was hugely influenced by that. That seems to have changed now. So I think just as a reflection with that, and this question here, someone said, as the education sector is becoming more like, like a business, how do, you think we, how do you think we can continue to share our knowledge whilst our business managers are trying to make us compete rather than share and collaborate. And I think the wonderful thing about all those projects that we were all involved in was that collaboration, that sharing, that shared risk as well, learning from failure, which we don't seem to be, we don't want to talk about that, or certain people don't want to talk about it that as much, but maybe we can yeah. I suppose there might be a, a strange paradox there, that the way in which communities can carry on talking is actually to close the door because then it's reducing the risk of uh, institutional secrets being shared with people outside of that level of trust, outside of those trust communities. But that pushes against our openness ethos 
and I'm not sure quite how we navigate that. But in my experience of senior managers uh, at a whole range of institutions is that they're really grateful that the people in their institutions are reaching out to expertise from other institutions. They'd just rather that their own dirty linen wasn't aired in the process. <laughs> so there's something about Chatham House rules, I think, and I know that's a challenge when we're trying to be as open as we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. um, and I suppose just another question that's coming in there, and I think you, you, you've touched on it. You. Oh, sorry, okay, sorry. Please. I'm just saying there's another question coming through there. Um, so how can we be both grounded in what institutions need, solving the problems for today, and, ex and at the same time explore, explore new ideas and new technologies? That's the perennial challenge yeah. for us all. Yeah. I suppose part of that is being brave enough that if, we've, if we think, hey, this would be a really good thing to do, and we think this will take us in a good direction, and I haven't learned this lesson yet myself, but it's being brave enough to really go and check with your stakeholders, whether they agree, <laughs> and to accept that if there's a number of people kind of shrugging their shoulders and say, yeah, yeah, you could, you could do that, that maybe it's not going to get traction, however hard you work. Mm. I think it's, it's a continuous process, isn't it? I yeah. Think it's something to do. Okay, now I'm going to, um, this is quite a tricky one, Amber, but hey, we're just going to put you on the spot. So someone says, the learning technologist profession isn't known by the wider community. The amount of times I've had to explain what I've had to do, yeah, I think we've probably all been there. A firefighter never has to explain their job. Could you succinctly <laughs> describe what learning technologies? I think that might be a general challenge yeah. to us all. Answers in 140 characters, please. <laughs> but there are a few definitions yeah. coming through. So I, I usually say to the stranger, I usually say uh, I manage a team who help people use technology in their teaching. I'm um, just going to ask you, any questions from the floor? No? Well, I think you've given us all a huge amount to think about, Amber. It was a fascinating talk. I really loved the way that you framed that in your timeline. I know lots of people are now creating their own timeline, so thank you for that. And again, can I just ask everyone to put their hands together and thank our fantastic keynote. <laughs>I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally, we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries. Um, obviously, education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is 
One of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.